let's go back then. Uh, okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, we will be waiting for around. Um, we'll be waiting for around uh, five minutes or so, and then I guess we can get started. It's 5 p.m. in the UK, where most of our audience is primarily located. Uh, so probably some people are jumping off calls. Uh, so let's let's be a bit patient. Where's everyone calling from today? Feel free to write in the chat. I'm in London. I'm in Southampton. Nice. Other people? Paris, Basingstoke, New Jersey, Athens. Nice, we're international. Quite international. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi there. Okay, let's wait a few more minutes and then we can get started. Okay, I guess we can um, start in one minute. Let me uh, share my screen. Um, I'll make a short intro and then we can get started. Oops. Okay, one more minute. OK. 
Okay, no one is waiting right now. Probably they're going to be joining soon. All right. So, hi, everyone. Thanks for um, being here with us today. Welcome to How to Lead um, How to Lead in Data Science, an event for CEOs, executives, and data scientists. Um, I'll be your host and moderator for today. For those of you who don't know me, you can call me Stelios. I've uh, been in the area of data science and AI for more than 10 years. Um, I act as a data science advisor uh, for various organizations, and I'm also a data science advisor for London Business School and University College London. And I've spent the last few years of my career as the CEO of the Desert Academy, a company whose mission is to educate decision makers on anything relating to data science and AI. I've also written up a book on that topic, which I'm more than happy to share with you for free. Uh, if you send me an email, uh, details to follow at the end of this event. So the Test Start Academy's objective is to help companies grow through data science and AI by adopting data science and AI and related technologies. And when, by, by, by decision makers, I'm referring to uh, CEOs, entrepreneurs, managers, it doesn't matter. What we do is we simplify technology down to a level that anyone can learn how to use it within the organization. So we don't help people become data scientists, but we help people understand how to maximize the impact of data science within the, their business or the business they uh, work for, whether it is about creating a data strategy or creating data products or hiring a team. These are some of the entrepreneurs we worked with. And these are some of the companies we worked with uh, from small companies to huge organizations like the US Navy and Vodafone. And we have programs for everyone, whether you're a solo entrepreneur, whether you're a startup, a scale-up, an SME, we do have something for you. And we're also expanding into other areas. Now we also have programs for project, product um, development, data-driven product development, project management. And we're also very proud to be the, the first company that is actively promoting the concept of data science coaching, something which you will be hearing about more and more in the next few years. Uh, we have many different programs and services through which we can support you. Um, we'll make sure to share some of those links in the chat. And also, if anyone wants a free copy of the book, The Decision Makers Handbook for Data Science, if you're a CEO, an entrepreneur, manager, you're definitely going to find it very useful. Simply send me an email. I'll be more than happy to send it to you. And as part of our mission of helping anyone, any decision maker, understand how to use data science and other technologies, we organize many, many free events. I'll be sharing a link to our calendar in the chat. And today we have a very, very interesting event with Dr. Jai Chong, uh, who is very experienced in leading in building and leading data science teams. Um, here's like he, his bio. Uh, and, you know, actually it's, it's, it's much longer, but I couldn't fit everything in, in one screen. Uh, and I'm sure he's, uh, he's probably going to make a better introduction to, to himself than I will ever be able to do. And Dr. Jaik decided to share his wisdom and he has written and published a book very recently called How to Lead in Data Science, uh, which I think is a very interesting book because any company these days is a data company, whether we like it or not, which means that sooner or later, you're gonna find yourself in a position where you might have to build and even lead a data science team, even if you're not a data yeah. scientist. And, but even if, if you're a data scientist, you're still going to find it very mm -hmm. relevant. Uh, yeah, and we, we have... Uh, Sorry. Yeah, and what I was saying is that um, yeah, and what I was saying is that we've also secured um, also secured a discount code from Manning Publications, which I'm also going to be sharing in the chat. So that, that's it for me. Uh, now, Jake will start his presentation. It will go for about thirty to forty-five minutes, and then there's going to be a Q and A session in the end. So I'll mute myself now, and Jake, the stage is yours. Great, thank you. Uh, let me make sure I can share my screen. Sonia, uh, thank you uh, for the introduction. Could you allow me to share the screen, please? Great, I got it. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's been a very interesting year for us all. Um, and uh, for the past year, I took the opportunity to write down many of the things that uh, I've been working with you know, over the past decade. It's a book called uh, How to Lead in Data Science. 
Uh, it's a practical guide for the unique challenges of data science leadership. And I wrote it to be able to have it help uh, data science practitioners at all levels. Because when I was working at LinkedIn, what I noticed was that 95% of the companies with data science teams have teams of fewer than 10 members. And yet they're providing great impact to their organizations. So how do you explore? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I also, uh, guys, please, please mute yourselves. Thank you. Great. Okay. So as long as people uh, can hear me, that's fine. Uh, so how do you explore and prioritize all the opportunities that, that's available for data scientists? Uh, and how do you set realistic expectations? Those are some of the really important questions for us all as practitioners in the domain. So in this talk, we'll be sharing many of the techniques and uh, best practices that I've seen in the field as well as practiced myself and see if that could be a potential reference for you. So, all right, let's uh, get right into it. Um, so, ah, there it is. So, as I mentioned, data science opened up a lot of new opportunities. So how are your organization uh, proposing and uh, setting the expectations and setting those priorities? What do you decide to do and what do you decide not to do? Well, there are a few ways that I've seen companies do this. For example, uh, they could be doing this from a company executive perspective, launching a big data science initiative, but grossly underestimating the efforts that's required. And in those cases, the data science teams often struggle to meet those goals. And while leaving many of the lower hanging fruit unclaimed uh, that they can see from the data. And in other places, we've also seen uh, data science teams gaining traction with early wins. Uh, but to scale those successes, it involves really heavy uh, cross-functional collaboration. And it's often in those particular collaborations where the project stagnates and progress stalls. So many of the very promising projects fail to realize the promised business outcome. So what we're really seeing there, if you were to summarize it, is there are like top-down processes and bottom-up processes. And both of them have advantages and both of them have their pitfalls. So what we as practitioners in data science need to do is really to look at what are these potentials and try to navigate around the, uh, those pitfalls. So there are four things that we can do in order to help ourselves make projects successful. They're explore and prioritize the projects, set realistic expectations, delegate effectively, and identify sponsors and champions for our project. And interestingly, a lot of these things are happening at different levels of leadership for data science. And in small teams, a single person could be responsible for multiple of these, but often they straddle over different levels of lead leadership in a particular company. And at the end, it, as we're planning and tackling emerging issues, there, are, there is this W process that can help bring all of those together. So in today's presentation, I'm going to actually work, work with you over a few specific personas that are facing different challenges and see how these particular techniques can help them better plan and prioritize their projects for their projects to be successful. So uh, before I go into much of the details, just a brief introduction about myself. I've been personally mentoring, promoting uh, many data science leaders uh, in my roles, uh, leading uh, data science teams in US and China in public and private companies. And uh, I've built multiple high-performing teams in these different situations, such as uh, taking Erin Digital public on the New York Stock Exchange as the data science executive there, uh, 
and also leading and expanding the data science team at Acorns that is going to be going public uh, later this year uh, through uh, SPAC and uh, also expanding uh, the team at LinkedIn uh, for hiring marketplace, which is the main product line for LinkedIn that has $4 billion a year in revenue. And today we also have a uh, opportunity for you to win two free book, uh, for two lucky people to win free books. And um, please, uh, the way to do it is to please share in the survey that I'm sending in the chat right now. It's a survey monkey link that helps uh, me to better understand what other topics that you'll be interested in hearing about sometime in the future if you have an opportunity to hear more about the book and how to lead in data science. So please take a look at that survey monkey either during or after the presentation or during the Q&A. And I'd love to hear back from you in terms of where your interests are. So the book is currently uh, finished all the uh, sections and it's uh, going into the production process and should be coming out in a few months in paper. But now you can already get it uh, as an ebook online in the Manning Early Access Program. Uh, so I'll move forward. And yeah, I've already talked about this. Uh, so let's get into it. Um, first, let's talk about explore and prioritize. And first, we're going to take a look at Brian. So, Brian may be a character that many of you are familiar with. Uh, He's a senior data scientist, just joined Z Corp as a senior data scientist two years ago, and is doing all right at Z Corp. But several colleagues who have joined around the same time have already been promoted. And Brian has his eye on becoming a technology leader with a short-term goal of getting promoted to staff data scientists and be able to lead a data science team uh, to do important projects. So he brought it up uh, with his manager, Walt, at the recent one-on-one, -on -one, but Walt just told him that he's doing all right, but needs to deliver more consistently. So what does that mean, you know, deliver more consistently? Well, it turns out that Brian has done most, the most number of projects as senior data scientist uh, per quarter at Z Corp, but none of those produce spectacular results. So, for example, when he's working with the marketing director uh, on a real-time marketing campaign, he's always, uh, who always want to have some additional insight after each meeting. So, Brian felt compelled to serve the project stakeholder and did extra work outside the original project scope. Uh, and this pushed out the start date of other projects, and he got delayed and had to compromise on quality on many other projects. So, Brian feels trapped in this cycle uh, that doesn't go anywhere. You know, what is happening? And how can Brian really advance his career and become a technology leader at uh, Z Corp? So what we think he can do is to take care of two aspects. First, provide personal accountability and ask the question behind the question. And then he can also use three levels of prioritization to uh, really help him understand how best to serve his stakeholders. So let's take a look at what, are, what these are. So first, asking the question behind the question. This is actually, there is actually a book behind this, um, which uh, is really talking about a significant area in uh, this. So the, the book is, is from uh, John G. Miller, uh, who's a question, wrote the book Question Behind the Question, uh, Practicing Personal Accountability at Work and Life. But what really this is about is really helping himself understand what the stakeholder is really asking him about so that um, he can better frame the question. So for example, when uh, he's looking at a marketing campaign, he can really be uh, understanding better, like what is the marketing professional looking for? Short-term engagement or long-term engagement? If it's long-term engagement, uh, is, the short, is the stakeholder looking for uh, targeting the active users to make them more engaged or the uh, other users like passive users or inactive users to bring them back? 
uh, or you know, to get on board more prospective users through understanding which marketing channels you use to get more long-term engagement. Each of those areas would uh, get you different problem framing. Um, and by asking that question behind the question, Brian is going to get to that. So that's the first part. And then let's take a look at the second part. Well, the second part is really looking at the three levels of prioritization. The first level uh, involves innovation versus impact. Very simple, two-dimensional axis. And the top right is where we all want to be, right? Uh, where uh, that's what we all want to be doing, high impact, highly innov innovative work. And the bottom left are the mundane stuff, like the reporting stuff that really needs to be automated. That's not so innovative and may not be so high impactful. But what we really need to be able to help the stakeholder do is to provide the business impact, which is sort of on the right hand side of the uh, graph, uh, that's providing the uh, quantitative proof for our projects uh, that shows that they are really um, producing uh, the business returns that they have. But we're, as we're working on this, we should be making sure that we're not burning out data scientist team members by doing these providing proof type of project and really provide those opportunities for data scientists to be doing what we all want to be doing. So that's the first level of filter that you can use as a data scientist to prioritize your work. There is also the more nuanced uh, approach by refining with this process called RICE, which uh, includes the reach, impact, confidence, and effort areas for your project. And for reach, uh, it's really about how many customers it can touch. For impact, is how effective your project can be. And then any, for any significant risks, right, uh, that's shows how confident you are about the success of the, company, uh, of the uh, project, as well as the amount of effort, how many people, how much time the project needs. And in all these different areas, uh, we're actually familiar as data scientists to uh, assign quantitative uh, numbers to these. So you can see that in a typical pro project prioritization process, you can have the reach impact, uh, the uh, risks and uh, or confidence and efforts uh, tabulated. And from reach and impact, you can calculate an upside. From the risks and effort, you can calculate the uh, confidence range of how much uh, input you, can, you need, how much investment you need into the project. And you can compute an ROI and using that ROI to prioritize your project. That may be simple to say, but many of the high impact projects uh, can require a lot of investment because the high impact project, they often require a full stack of technology from data source identification, data aggregation, data enrichment, model, uh, model methodology design, evaluation frameworks, and A-B testing. So even though they're high impact, there may be a lot of investment that needs to be done. How do we deal with this? Well, there's a third level of prioritization you can take a look at, which is aligning to data strategy. And what you can do with a data strategy is to figure out for where many of the components, for example, data source uh, identification or data enrichment efforts could actually benefit multiple projects on your project roadmap. So you can actually amortize the investment in those components so that it lowers the actual investment assigned to one particular project and increases the ROI so that they can be prioritized better uh, on your prioritization list. And all this requires someone like Brian, who is really on the ground doing the project to be really familiar with what it takes for the project to be successful so that uh, he can provide this information to, into this table for, prior, for the whole team to prioritize what everyone should be working on. And through this prioritization process, you can also be more effective in pushing back to the stakeholders who would want more uh, and 
uh, and want the project scope to increase in the middle of a project so that he can say, hey, you know, there is a really high priority project uh, coming down the line that I really need to be working on so that uh, he can uh, time box his effort on any one particular project. So in conclusion, uh, for Brian, uh, he can better coordinate with partners by having personal response accountability to ask the question behind the question and use three levels of prioritization, uh, which involves looking at projects as if they're uh, innovative and impactful, refining the prioritization with uh, rice, and also figuring out what is the uh, team data strategy and better align his project with that team strategy. And then we can go on to setting realistic expectations. Now, setting realistic expectations is more than just figuring out the impact and uh, uh, looking at what the upside is for a project. It's also about often working with executives. So let's take a look at uh, Jennifer, a tech lead, who is actually quite successful uh, in this area. He, she's uh, uh, joined uh, the company six years ago as a BI uh, business intelligence uh, analyst and got promoted twice, right? You know, first to a leader, to then uh, helped start the data science team at this company. And he's, she's actually uh, regularly pressured to accomplish the impossible from uh, other uh, executives who are not necessarily data scientists, but have seen uh, some use cases, uh, industry use cases, and want those kind of insert use cases to be done at her company. So he, she, uh, Jennifer is really good with uh, pushing back while maintaining the relationship, which is really the hard part, right? But how is she doing it? So let's take a look. Um, well, uh, what she's doing is she's interpreting the four levels of expectations for success and really evaluating those with the partner together uh, in three dimensions on readiness, riskiness, and reception. Let's see what these are, right? So for the four levels of uh, confidence or uh, setting those expectations, there is a recommendation ranking, assistance, automation, and autonomous agent. Uh, you, you can even sort of map this to autonomous driving today if you want, right? Really, uh, most of the technology is in the assistant piece, but uh, many of the marketing pitches are on the automation and on autonomous agent area, which uh, is really many of the reasons why the industry is not quite meeting many uh, technology savvy users' expectations. So let's look at particularly how this looks in any one particular data science project that we would be working on as data pr practitioners. So for recommendation ranking, this is a very typical you know, ranking, uh, like search ranking algorithms, uh, product recommendation type of problems, where the main purpose is to bring a vast set of potential content to the attention of the customer wh who has limited attention span. So the goal is to anticipate what content would be most engaging for a particular segment of users and preferably personalized to a particular user. And uh, for the sex success here, the, the recommendation is often evaluated in this metric called Lyft, where you know, even for, for going from 4% engagement to 5% engagement, you're talking about a 25% lift, which could be quite significant in terms of the business return. That you can bring for a business. And then for the assistant area, we're talking about uh, machine learning models that produce results that's close to human capability, but not quite uh, enough at human capability yet. So typical models is the uh, loan uh, fraud detection uh, scenario where the use case calls for an algorithm to alert for a suspicious loan applications. And the expectation is for human fraud investigators to be able to assess and decide whether a loan application should be rejected uh, if it's likely to be fraudulent. And for readiness here, uh, a fraud detection uh, model should be at least at the precision of like 25% or more so that when the fraud investigators investigate them, 
uh, one out of four is an actual loss, and that would be worthwhile uh, in terms of the time, where you know uh, more than 66% or two thirds of recall would be uh, perceived as uh, useful, uh, as you know you can at least catch three out of uh, two out of three uh, cases of fraud. So, uh, and then in automation, we're talking about the uh, machine learning models really producing results at human parity, right? Many uh, of the cases with uh, speech recognition for medical transcription or um, home uh, voice uh, controlled systems are already at this level. And then you have automate, autonomous agents where we're talking about high frequency trading scenarios where a human trader just can't respond at that uh, uh, like in microseconds uh, compared to uh, when uh, in taking some markets, marketing signal, market signals, or in sometimes in power grid uh, balancing where the uh, uh, physics of electricity needs to be responded to much faster than what a human can do. So with a deeper understanding of what the customers, um, uh, of the customers and the, uh, all the improvements in modern capabilities, um, you, solutions can slowly move up this confidence ladder, right? For some of the, uh, the financial advisory uh, recommendations that I worked on, uh, we were able to increase in confidence and moving it up to the assistant level when the accuracy in our financial uh, recommendations can be higher to help people save and invest more at, at Acorns, uh, which is a micro-investment platform. So uh, whereas you know, other failures occurs when real unrealistic expectations are set. So uh, in summary, Jennifer is able to be able to help stakeholders better set expectations uh, so that uh, she can eliminate team pressure uh, in these areas as, as from delivering things outside the scope of what technology and data uh, can provide at any particular time in time. And this really helps improve team morale and team retention at these data science teams. Great. So now we've looked at uh, how this would uh, appear at the data scientist level, as well as the data science uh, tech lead level. Let's also look at the data science manager level. How do we delegate effectively? So now let's talk about Audra, the data science manager. Audra has a master's in computer science and um, she has been a data science leader at the uh, startup, managing both uh, projects and teams. Uh, and at this team, uh, a team of four data scientists specifically. So uh, she's been keen to develop her career and she wanted to uh, have an opportunity to uh, be a manager at a larger company in the same industry. But when she started the interview process, uh, she was quite confident and she's passed all the technical tests. But when she uh, had, uh, when she uh, went through the more virtue uh, tests or the uh, managers uh, management capability test, uh, she was passed on. So uh, the reasons that the company provided was that she was not a culture fit, but. That's a very general statement. And Audra's confused about what exactly is going on with her interviews. So she thought she conveyed her passion in developing her career, and what, uh, but is really uh, baffled at what she could be doing differently. Um, so what is really happening here? Well, it turns out that she focused on building her own career, but spoke little about her team uh, because the responsibility of a team manager is really to empower her team members to do the best work of their career and uh, to take care of the company whenever possible. So during her interview, she wasn't able to speak that much about her team and she didn't have a succession plan yeah, if she left her old company. So what to do about it? 
well, um, she can be more uh, nuanced about how she nurtures her team. And two of the things she can do well on and develop a narrative about is to avoid micromanaging the team and start delegating uh, to nurture the team's team member's career, not just her own. So what does that mean? How does that look like? Well, for manager. So how do we talk about delegation and that micromanagement? Well, as first time managers, um, and many of us have been or are, uh, managing is, it can be anxious. It's, it's, it's natural to feel anxiety when you're first uh, a manager. And, uh, you are giving control of implementation to teams, to team members, and you're letting go of a lot of the details of the, te the technical details in projects. So at first people may uh, tend to uh, attend all the standups and meetings for all projects and asking the team directly about their blockers rather than uh, uh, asking the team lead, uh, the project lead to uh, report on those areas and really scrutinize the project leads decision and overrule some of them sometimes. So these are signs about uh, on micromanaging, but how do we avoid them? Well, there's actually a pretty uh, tried and true standard process for delegation um, that's a best practice uh, in engineering leadership that data scientists can adopt. It involves these seven steps. Well, it's quite elaborate, but let's uh, talk through this. Uh, there is uh, setting the goal and providing the context for the goals, as well as uh, defining success, defining the boundaries of what the project can do, uh, what the uh, team member can do or cannot do, and confirming understanding, aligning on next steps, and reviewing the project on the agreed upon milestones only. So what does that process look like? So goal is really to communicate how you, like thing get, how you would like the project to get done and preferably fo following the SMART goals, right? Like the specific, me measurable, achievable, uh, relevant and time, time bound criteria. And the clearer your goal is, the easier it will be for you to review it later at the last step. And then the most important piece is to provide the context and providing uh, why the project matters and why your team member should understand the purpose and impact. Uh, so this is really reflecting back, you know, asking the question behind the question uh, so that you understand what the stakeholder really wants. And there may be many decisions your team member has to make and the clearer the context, the better those detailed decisions can be. And then the definition of success. This is really the metrics of success that's essential to evaluate the performance afterwards. Uh, and often uh, the root cause for employees not performing to uh, expectation comes down to a manager not providing a, a good, clear success metric. And a framework uh, for doing this could be, you know, do this, not that, so that you know you're provide, using your data science capabilities uh, to provide the positive examples, negative examples, and setting these definitions of success. And you know, we've all potentially have seen those data scientists who are very innovative and creative in seeking out resources to get projects done. So one other thing is to set the boundary of what resources are on the table to be used for a particular project and who should not be bothered uh, on uh, some of the decisions and what decisions should be escalated uh, in a process. And then after you have presented this, you know, just because you talk to your team member about this doesn't mean that they heard it. So it's also important to confirm understanding after defining the goals the metrics, the context and the boundaries. So to ask the team member to speak, talk, back, talk uh, through this in their own words uh, so that uh, they can convey what they understood from this delegation process. And then also align on the next steps, setting up the milestones and review the projects according to those milestones. So those reviews don't be, uh, aren't perceived as micromanaging. And you can see you know, delegation 
actually takes up work, take, takes up work, right? It's a lot of work. So how do you decide what to delegate? That's where you can use this uh, framework, the prioritization uh, matrix, the PMAT. This is actually a, a piece of uh, technology, if you would, or methodology that's uh, presented by Daniel Shapiro, currently uh, LinkedIn's COO. Uh, and he published this uh, back uh, in 2013 on how to manage projects. So for many first time managers, right? Um, if you look at this met matrix, uh, when you have projects that has a higher or low probability of success and higher or low size of return or size of the price, uh, you can split into these quad quadrants. So you may have the home runs, the small wins, the big bets, and the junks, right? So um, what are uh, some of the ways that you would delegate? Often when I ask first time managers to do this, the answer is to focus on home runs and the big bets. And the, it's sort of instinctive to prioritize people, uh, to prioritize these projects with large payoff. So how would a experienced manager do this? Well, Dan suggests that uh, one should really be focusing on the big backs and the small wins first because they have high likelihood of success. And how would uh, he spend his time? So he would actually take a look at his team and delegate the home runs to his star players. These are projects with high price or high return and high probability of success so that this can really help his uh, or her, or in this case, Audra's uh, star team members to succeed in those projects. And as a manager, because there's high confidence of success, that's actually the time where Audra, uh, that's actually the area where Audra doesn't have to spend much time on. And then she can delegate the small wins to uh, more junior team members and spend a little bit more time guiding them through this process. And it also provides a, a bit of a buffer in case uh, that some of these small win project doesn't turn out uh, for whatever reason that's unforeseeable uh, for, by junior team member, by the execution uh, variation in junior team members, she can either step in to help it bring, bring it back on track or you know, uh, ha let it be an experience setting process for the junior team members and not have too big a loss uh, in terms of the deliverables for the team. And where she can spend a little bit more time on is the big bets, but not a lot of big bets, usually just one project where she can spend uh, more team aligning the team and removing risks uh, in these big bets to nurture it either into a home run or to really guide it personally because she's really experienced in this, uh, technically in this area, so that uh, these big bets can uh, go on to produce success for the company. But then we come to the area of junk, right? Like, what about the junk? The low probability of success and the low price. But what Dan suggests is actually these are, should be the area that Audra takes on. The people would say like, why would you take on the junk? Well, because these have low probability of success and these actually should be the, pro the projects who, that should be canceled. So what Audra can do is spend time on these projects and actually either turn them into big bets by increasing the return on investments on them or um, making them into automation projects rather than really doing them uh, manually so that they may become small wins or even home runs. And for those projects that's really not worth doing, really she's the only person who's got authority uh, or is able to escalate this to other uh, stakeholders um, to be able to cancel the project. So in this process, this is an alternative perspective to understand how best to delegate uh, your projects so that each delegation, although it takes a lot of time to delegate well, 
can be worthwhile and can really lead to successful project in the end. Love to get your perspective on this uh, in the Q&A and see uh, whether this work, uh, whether you've uh, seen some of uh, this processes work out or not work out in their, your work. So in conclusion here for Audra, uh, her role is to really empower the team to do the best work of their career and to apply the seven step process in delegating and to delegate the home runs and small wins to nurture the team and take on one big bet and the junks uh, to uh, make sure that uh, they are either canceled or turned into more uh, successful projects. Great, so with all this, we come down to the final one, the identifying sponsors and champions. So with all those work from the data scientist, the team lead, and the team manager, what can the director level person do? So let's take a look at Steven, a uh, respected data science director. And he spent 15 years in the industry, very respected, with deep technical background and excellent working relationships. But he's noticed that the team morale has been low recently. And he's seeing like high potential members of team depart for other opportunities. So he's concerned and bothered. So what is happening? Well, it turns out that uh, many projects have been uh, not successful, not because of the data scientists, the uh, way the projects are run from his perspective, but um, it turns out the, the, the uh, partner teams had to adjust priorities several times. And those has impacted the um, uh, progress of the data science teams and some home run projects actually got canceled in, in the end. So his star team members didn't really get the success that they're looking for to develop their careers. So what can Stephen do about it? So let's look at how he can identify sponsors and champions. So what are sponsors and champions? So sponsor for a project is usually a senior member, uh, senior business leader really, uh, with the authority to muster subject matter experts, headcounts, data, equipment, and funding towards a solution. So uh, this is often a, 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 they may not be aware of all the technical details, but will be responsible for evaluating if a business objective is achieved. On the other hand, a champion is usually a mid to senior level executive who is intimately familiar with the project's technical and business merit, and also is often a uh, business beneficiary for a successful project. So when a collaborating team partner, pro, uh, team partner um, uh, looks to adjust priority, priorities and consider dropping the project, it's a champion who must uh, emerge to uh, uh, strongly advocate for the project and negotiate with the team, uh, with the partner team to reprioritize a project so that the project uh, can uh, continue to succeed. And when the project encounters stressful situations, the champions are also there to encourage and inspire the team to keep moving forward. So Stephen himself is a mid to senior level executive. So he can be uh, the uh, speaking to uh, the strategic importance of many projects with his peers. So he can be champions for some projects, uh, especially those that are associated with the data science infrastructure, uh, but for other business related ones, he should really be talking to a uh, marketing VP or marketing um, uh, director uh, to be able to uh, advocate for their projects when these prioritization changes. So this can really help the team uh, deprioritize projects with high risk of failure and prioritize projects that is looking promising so that uh, uh, Stephen can identify these sponsors and champions for all his project uh, to be able to help his project team's project to be successful over time. Great, so that's with Stephen. Now, how do we link all these efforts together? 
So there is this W process uh, that's uh, discussed and used in many high-performing teams like Airbnb and Eventbrite. So it involves uh, the separation of concerns and processes uh, between the executives and the team members. So in this case, the executives specify high-level vision, uh, which reduces wasted effort from the team members proposing a lot of plans outside the top priority areas. And that, that was one of the challenges we talked about at the bottom-up process, right? And then the team members can propose those plans that's aligned with high-level vision and strategy so that uh, they can uh, send these plans to the executives and Stephen, like the, the data science director, the function leader, uh, along with other uh, function uh, executives can collect the feedback from the, the team uh, to integrate and prioritize these projects to make, uh, sorry, to, to can, can be able to um, integrate the, these projects. And then the team can uh, take a look at the tweaks and confirm the buying for the final project so that the executives, executives can uh, bring all these final plans together to make the coherent strategy. So with these particular steps, um, in a small team, some team leads, the data science team lead is also the team function uh, manager, right? So uh, many of these functions can be done by the same person in a very small team. But as the organization grows, uh, there are many benefits in providing this uh, process when you are planning 20, 30 projects per quarter. So with this W process, uh, we're bringing together all this exploration process, uh, setting realistic expectations, delegating projects effectively, and helping project to be successful with the uh, sponsor and champion process. Uh, now, let's take a look at how this fits in in the book, Leading in Data Science. So really, in this book, we've touched many of the different areas. And uh, we've talked about the different levels of executive, um, uh, the different levels of leadership uh, from tech leads to team managers to function uh, directors to company executives. And um, what we actually talked about uh, are actually many of the capabilities that uh, the team members can acquire in performing their roles. And in this particular case, we have three different areas of capabilities, technology, uh, execution, and expert knowledge, which we call the T, right? And the technology is really the tools and frameworks for you to lead more effectively. The execution is the practices for you to specify the projects from vague requirement and prioritize and plan the project and balancing difficult trade-offs. And for expert knowledge, we're talking about the domain knowledge or the industry domain knowledge you have to clarify a project alignment with the organization's vision and mission. And you can account also for the data and source nuances and navigate the uh, organization structures uh, in particular industries. And then in the book, we also talk about the virtues. And the virtues are the ethics, uh, rigor and attitude. For ethics is the standard of conduct at work that enables you to avoid unnecessary self-inflicted breakdowns. And there are many aspects of these uh, work ethics for data scientists, including uh, data use, project execution, and teamwork. And then we also touch on the rigor, which is the craftsmanship that generates trust in the results that we produce as well as the attitude, which are the mood with which we, we bring to the workplace uh, with positivity and tenacity to work through a lot of failures. And we should be also collaborative and curious team members in a broader organization. And for the things that with the concept that we talked about, we talked about uh, explore and prioritize, set, setting realistic expectations, delegating effectively, 
identifying sponsors and champions and systematically planning with a W process. And those are the highlighted few areas that we touch on. And there is a lot more uh, in the book, uh, like you see in the slide, uh, like really what, 72 different areas that we, main areas we touch on and many techniques and best practices. And if you like the particular perspective that we talked through today, there are actually a few more sessions or recorded uh, uh, YouTube videos that you can find about Brian, Jennifer, uh, and Audra, and Stephen, as well as Paul and Kathleen, uh, Catherine. And uh, there is uh, uh, links uh, online for many of these capabilities. And also, uh, there is the chance for us to uh, for you to win two free books. Um, and please uh, go to uh, scan this to the barcode or go to that Survey Monkey link uh, to share um, what you found most useful in this particular session, as well as some other topics that you may want to hear from uh, me or uh, have a session on in the future. And I'm happy to uh, find opportunities to share more with you. So uh, that in short is uh, the concludes uh, the specific session today. I'll pass it back to um, Stanios and uh, see if there is uh, questions and answers. And uh, I'm looking at the chat and if you have any questions, feel free to type it there as well. Uh, and also feel free to ask any questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jack. It was very, very interesting and uh, illuminating. Are there any questions from the audience? I'm going to add the reaction as well. So people, okay. <laughs> Melanie says, thank you. Uh, it looks one person has a, a question. Uh, Ganasiam, would you like to go ahead? Hi, um, thanks. Uh, thanks, Dr. Chung, for a really nice talk. So uh, I'm still a grad student trying to move to data science, uh, hopefully after, after defending my thesis sometime this summer. Um, so, and uh, when we switch to industry, then we don't necessarily get these leadership positions. So how do you, what do you recommend uh, for people like me to like advice, uh, you know, advisors or some suggestion uh, to people who are higher up in the ranking, so that like not not everyone takes this like nice and easy, right? So, yes, thank you. That's a great question. Yeah, in the book we actually touch on one example for um, uh, data scientists or uh, future data scientists or people who are coming into the area. Uh, the first air, the first advice that I would have is understand what are some of the expectations for uh, data scientists from the uh, industry. And some of the ways to understand it is uh, from the technology execution expert knowledge area, as well as these sort of uh, culture fit <laughs> areas like the ethics, rigor, and attitude. And if you look at many of the areas uh, we talked about in the book uh, for a tech lead, it's actually an aspirational goal for a lot of new data scientists as well. It's really uh, looking at, as you're interviewing for a data scientist position, different companies may have different interview strategies. Some may ask you some standard modern questions some may ask you to enrich some data. Some may ask you to uh, describe a whole data pipeline that you may have uh, established in a research project or an internship. So uh, we describe for our uh, uh, person who is just getting into the field, Anya, is the case that we work on in the book. Uh, she was uh, a, a really talented uh, technologist, uh, a, someone who has done internships, who has done well in school, but had a lot of challenges in navigating the interview process. 
And part of the challenge is that variety in different companies focus. And as you uh, go through the interview process, it would help to understand many of these area of expectations. And we also touch on in uh, some of the chapters in the book uh, in chapter 10 at the end uh, about uh, what are some of the ways that you can evaluate the industry landscape, right? So if you look at the industries that uh, uses a lot of data science, obviously the internet industry, right? The software industry uh, that employs, uh, they employ about 40% of all the data scientists or who, people who with data scientist titles in the industry. And there are emerging areas like uh, the financial technologies, either in traditional banking, in the new uh, bank uh, challengers, uh, as well as uh, more traditional uh, in in insurance industries. They, they're hiring a lot of data scientists as well as healthcare industry that has some of the highest growth in the number of um, uh, data scientists that they're hiring year over year. And if you have specific interest in say gaming or online education uh, or uh, defense, and those are some of the uh, new emerging areas that are not yet employing a lot of data scientists, but uh, have, have very fast growth. Um, and it could be, or yeah, many people have a uh, strong interest in gaming and uh, there's a lot of data science that's used in those areas. So, and you can also uh, evaluate for any particular area, for any particular opportunity, uh, what is the company like, or what is the industry like, for example? What is the company like? Uh, what is the company standing in its industry? Is it one of the gorillas, if you would, like the top company in the industry? Is it a challenger or like ch uh, chimpanzee uh, type? Uh, I'm referring to the, uh, the uh, innovation cycle and the, uh, the uh, inside the tornado technologies about um, how to look at the industry landscape for any particular industry, um, uh, or one of the smaller companies, which all have different needs and different amount of investment that they can make for a data science team, as well as how the team looks like in terms of the maturity of the manager who's interviewing you, like what stage of career are they in? Are they early stage who would be uh, very nurturing, but sometimes may micromanage? Or are they more mature that may be more hands-off uh, that would often require you to be more mature about how to navigate uh, particular uh, business relationships? Uh, so many of those needs to, uh, uh, can be helpful as you enter the workforce in the data science field. Does that help? Yeah, I did. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for the question. Great, anyone else? Do you have any questions? Um, just a very quick question for me. Um, myself, when I'm data science manager, um, just in terms of uh, uh, how we uh, mention the value of the data science projects to this execs, are there any, any I know you touched upon a few, but are there any ways or things that you might expand on? Yes, absolutely. So, uh, there is actually a lot of challenges at times to speak about the return on investment. So let me go back to that particular slide uh, right here. Yes, oops, not that one, right here. Yes, uh, so we talked about the reach impact, uh, risk and effort, right? Uh, some of these dimensions are easier to investigate, some of them are harder. Often reach is easier to investigate because you're talking about particular cohorts and uh, many data science teams already have dashboards about uh, what kind of customers, like either engaged customers or uh, disengaged customers or uh, potential customers that you would have for a particular area. Uh, the effort is often easier to estimate, especially if you're an experienced manager who have done similar projects before. The risks are a little harder, or the confidence, but with uh, good relationships with other uh, leaders in the company, like 
uh, engineering managers or marketing professionals, you may assess some of the domain specific risks or technology risks and provide a range of uh, efforts uh, or uh, a uh, error bar, if you would, of effort um, to accomplish the task. The hardest part to estimate often is the impact, right? So before you do a, a recommendation algorithm, it's really hard to see to say whether the lift is going to be 20% or 40% or more, right? So that's where a lot of attention should be given uh, in terms of providing uh, a range of uh, efforts uh, or providing a range of impact that could be meaningful to the business. Now, rather than like coming out with promising, say, I'm going to have 20% lift uh, for this particular new algorithm with new data that nobody has seen before, what you can do is to ask the reverse question. What kind of lift would make this project have a large enough ROI for it to be important enough to be prioritized? And that often have these kind of threshold where the uh, executives has better sense of, right? So uh, a marketing professional may say that, hey, you know, 5% lift is good enough at, uh, for a very mature uh, product. Whereas really for a, a new product, we're looking for the low hanging fruit that has 40% lift or more. So for those kind of assessments, you can ask the question behind the question like what we discussed today and get the uh, high level threshold so that you can understand what kind of impact is meaningful and really bring that back and see uh, what kind of ROI is really uh, realistic so that you can better prioritize your project. Now, if you have a project that uh, even if you get 5% lift, you could have an outsized business impact, then that's probably a good project to be pitching to uh, cross-functionally to engineering teams, to uh, the business teams uh, to be prioritized. If a project is on the margin, like say 5% lift, it's, you may assess it's challenging to get and it barely makes it to the prioritization uh, boundary. Well, you may need to uh, re-establish the project or find alternatives or maybe uh, use another project to amortize some of the cost in uh, enriching the data or uh, building the data pipeline for some of the features so that you can make the project more worthwhile and then find the project champions uh, to be able to fight for you uh, when uh, you encounter uh, some resistance uh, for this project. Does that help? Is this uh, been off? Yeah, so, uh, thank, thank you very much for that. That really uh, helps. And it's, like you say, it's more uh, uh, setting up the, uh, the uh, range and making sure the conversations is, uh, the two-way conversations are happening. So uh, especially to your point, Turn the question the other way around. That makes uh, yeah, that makes complete sense. Thank you. Great. Great. Thanks for your question. Very interesting. Anyone else? Okay, I think we have no more questions. So thanks everyone. Big clap for uh, Jake. Uh, this was a very very interesting conversation. Maybe we'll be organizing another event in the future. Uh, just a couple of reminders um, to check out some of our other free events. We actually have one more tomorrow. You can check this out. Uh, please send an email for the Decision Makers Handbook to Data Science. And also, if you're going to get a discount for Jack's book, here is the, the, the link. So thanks, everyone. And we hope to see you again soon in some other of our events. Thank you, Jack. Thank you for having me. Thanks everyone, bye bye.